Have you ever had one of those problems where you know that if you were to really examine this thing to fix it, it would just be a total mess? It would be costly. This is especially true when it has to do with your vehicle. Um, I'd love to introduce you to Bertha. This is Bertha. She is our Dodge Grand Caravan minivan, uh, and she served our family well for several years. Up until about the last year that we drove her, during that time, she began just spouting problems. She would do this weird thing where when you drive down the freeway, she would shake. And I mean shake, like a toddler that just drank a pot of coffee. Like she would shake and it was like you were getting a massage while you're driving down the freeway. It was kind of awesome. But all of these problems sounded so expensive. And I just told my wife, like, maybe it'll just go away. You know, maybe, maybe things will take care of themselves. So we let it go. And more problems began springing up. And everything came to a head when we're driving home from Grant's Pass. We, we had just summited Roberts Mountain. We took the curve. And I got out in the midst of a rainstorm to pass a semi. Now, everybody in Oregon knows passing a semi in a rainstorm is a terrible idea. You can barely see through the windshield wiper sweeps. You're just trusting Jesus in that moment. So I'm tense. I'm kind of freaking out, going 70 miles an hour, passing the semi in the rainstorm. And all of a sudden, I got no control over the vehicle. None. I can, I'm, I'm pulling at the steering wheel, and I can't get the car to turn. We're inching closer and closer and closer to the semi. And I freaked out. I said, Shaughnessy, we're going to hit the semi. We're going to die. Now, let me give you a bit of parenting advice. If you have three toddlers in the back seat, don't yell out, we're going to die, because now they're in the back seat freaking out just like I am. Daddy said we're going to die. I'm in the front seat freaking out. My, my wife's the only one in the car that has any emotional stability in this moment. And she's like, okay, we're going to turn the wheel together because we thought it was stuck. So we, we start turning it to, to go with the curve and we get the car to actually make the turn. We pull over into the slow lane and I was like, oh, okay, I can calm down. This thing is hard to drive, but at least it's a straight stretch right now. We won't worry about pulling off the freeway and addressing the problem. We'll wait till we get home. Well, that was a terrible choice because uh, the car is not making it home. It's so difficult to drive even in a straight line that we had to pull off the side of the freeway and finally address some of the problems with our vehicle. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I, I had felt kind of like a moron because I, I had made such a fool of myself in front of my bride. So when we stopped the car, I said, babe, I'm going to check under the hood. As though I know anything about underneath the hood, right? I, my dad was a mechanic. He did not pass that gene onward. And so I go up there and I go to open the hood and I don't know how to open the hood. I don't know how to open it. And so I asked my wife for some help and she helps me open the hood. And then she goes back to console the children that I just freaked out. And I'm looking at this expensive piece of machinery. I'm like, I don't know. I expected to see a fire or like smoke or something like a piece of metal blown up. I had no idea what I was looking at. And as I looked closer, though, there was little bits of rubber belt just blown about the whole engine. And I thought, you know, that, that probably shouldn't be there. <laughs> so I pick up a piece of it and I walk back to my wife and I said, babe, I think I found the problem. It's the rubber thing. She's like, the rubber thing? We're going to call somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. But there was a problem with our vehicle that went unaddressed. And because it went unaddressed, we were actually in a really dangerous situation. When problems go unaddressed, they grow. Today, we're going to begin a series in the, in the book of Colossians, where we're going to be looking at a letter that a guy named Paul wrote to a specific church in a city named Colossae. And he wrote this letter because there were some problems going on within that church. And he knew the very thing I learned that day. When problems go unaddressed, they grow. And he saw the trajectory of the church and said, we need to make some alterations. A little bit of background about Paul. Paul would have been voted least likely to become a Christian in his high school class. He was a religious Jewish man, a zealous man for his faith. Uh, he was a Pharisee. He would have had massive portions of the Old Testament memorized. Uh, he was schooled under a renowned rabbi, a renowned teacher. He was highly educated. And when Paul saw the, the kind of the movement of the early church, when Jesus ascended to heaven, uh, he saw something he wanted to snuff out. In fact, he was so zealous in getting rid of this movement that he was there at the, at the, uh, the first 
martyr's death. The first person who died for their, for their faith in Jesus, a guy named Stephen who was proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And Paul was there approving of and encouraging his execution as people picked up stones and hurled them at Stephen until his skull was crushed and he died. And you would think that might suffice Paul's bloodlust, but it doesn't because he then goes to the authorities and he gets permission from the authorities to continue this tirade of terror and he takes it on to Damascus. That's the man who wrote this book. Now you may logically be asking, why do I want to know anything that guy has to say? Well, his journey doesn't end there. You see, on the way to Damascus, he has a radical encounter with Jesus Christ. He's traveling with some companions and in a miraculous way, light just shows up in a booming voice, knocks everybody to the ground. Paul is instantly blinded. In a moment, he's humbled. And he, he says, the voice of Jesus Christ says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? You see, the way that Paul was treating the church was really indicative of Paul's heart towards Christ. Why are you persecuting me? And Paul had a radical transformation. God took a murderer and gave him a mission. He went from persecuting the church to pursuing God. And in fact, he was instrumental in building up the early church. Most of the New Testament letters that we have were written by Paul. In fact, this very book we're going to be studying, Colossians, was written by Paul while he was imprisoned in Rome. He was imprisoned in Rome because of his faith, and he wrote this letter. Now, I've been to jail. You don't write helpful, encouraging, awesome letters like the book of Colossians in jail. You write emo poetry about your girlfriend who left you because of your legal troubles, okay? I'm not speaking from experience, I promise. No, I'm just kidding. But Paul wrote this encouraging letter from jail. This is a man who bleeds mission. He's in a desperate, despairing situation in a Roman prison. And he bleeds mission as he is pursuing, encouraging these other people in the faith that he had most likely never met. He hadn't been to the Colossian church. And so he writes them a letter for them. And then there was this little trade where they would circulate these letters around the churches. And he was writing to a, a church who really needed to hear from him. Colossae was a, at one point it was a prominent, prominent city. Uh, but by the time Paul was on the scene. It had diminished in prominence. It was well known for its fabric dyes at one point, but it had diminished. It was really a no man's town. And by the time Paul was on the scene, there was not much going on there, but he cared for the church there. And there were some real problems going on. They had issues with the worship of angels. They had issues within their families. There was, there was difficulties within the families that needed to be addressed. And probably most uh, alarming of all was their view of Jesus. They had they had some teaching that was coming in that was distorting their view of Jesus. And you'll see in the book of Colossians some of the most lofty, high language about Jesus in all of the New Testament. That's the guy that we're going to be learning from. A man who understands gospel transformation and the mission of God. We're going to be reading through the first 14 verses of Colossians 1 today. It begins like this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. See, remember, Paul has never met this, this group of people. He's never met this church before. So he begins with his uh, introducing himself and giving his credentials. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. This was not Paul's idea. In fact, he was going to Damascus to continue to persecute the church. And God came down and said, nope. And then he says, Timothy, our brother. Timothy was somebody who Paul was a spiritual father to. And he had been discipling Timothy. And Timothy, most scholars agree, was the scribe for Paul. He's probably the one who wrote this letter as Paul kind of guided him along in that. And he says, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. This is to the church in Colossae. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you had for all of God's people. This is amazing to me. Paul has never met them before, but he knows two things about their faith. He has never met them before, but there's rumors about their faith. They trust Jesus and they love people well. That's awesome. And he goes on, he tells us where this faith and this love springs from. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about what you've already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. 
It continues and says, in the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. What I want you to see in this particular portion is it's the gospel that transforms. The gospel is what changes us. Let's look at it again in the passage. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it. Since the day they heard it. When I first heard about the gospel, I thought it was a moment in time where God gave me a ticket out of hell and then I had to figure out the rest of my life and I'll see him when I die. That's really what I thought the gospel was. But in Romans 1, it says, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God for salvation for anybody who believes. And we're saved in three different ways. We're saved from the penalty of sin because Jesus took that penalty on the cross. He died in our place. We are saved from the power of sin. That because Jesus overcame, we have power. We have his life in us. And as we walk in the Holy Spirit, we can overcome sin. And one day, we will be rid of the presence of sin when we are face to face with God in eternity. You see, my initial understanding of the gospel was I knew Jesus took my penalty and I knew one day I'd see God. But the rest of my life, I had to wrestle against sin with all of my own might. And here's what he says here. The opposite is true. You don't wrestle in your own might. The gospel is the thing that changes you. And it does it day to day. Since the day the Colossians heard the gospel, there is this continual transformation that took place in their lives. The gospel is what changes us. This is uh, my daughters, Emberlyn and Audra. They're beautiful. Um, they've actually given me permission to share this story. They're brave little girls who are allowing daddy to share. Um, quarantine has done a number on their relationship. They've really been fucking heads. Um, and so Shaughnessy and I, we kind of came up with a, a mental toolkit, a mental checklist for them to walk through to bring problems to resolution. And uh, the first rule is, or the first tool in their toolkit is pray. Stop what you're doing. When your voices get loud, when you feel tight in your chest, stop what you're doing and pray. Ask God for help. And then you do what he says. The second thing is put your hands behind your back <laughs> because hands are for helping, not hitting. Use I statements. Don't tell people what they are. A big one in our house that we're trying to overcome is you're rude. Don't tell people what they are. Jesus tells us who we are. Don't tell people what they are. And so they have this mental toolkit. And a couple of weeks back, uh, my wife was at work. It's just me and the kids. And my daughters are in the hallway. I mean, it's just chaos, right? Just yelling, screaming back and forth. And I am so frustrated. I'm so tired of the bickering. I'm so tired of the arguing. I just want them to be friends. Like they could have an awesome time together. Um, and so I go back there. I have this emotional tornado in my chest. Like it's this tension. I can feel my face is flush. But I am doing the best I can in my own ability to keep it cool. And so I go back there and I use a soft voice. And I said, after giving their consequence for not working it out, I said, girls, did you use your toolkit? And simultaneously, in unison, they roll their eyes and slam their doors in my face. And I got so angry. I, I just saw red. I was so hurt by that. And I'm not proud of this, but to be honest with you, I got up and I slammed my daughter Emberlyn's door open. And in doing so, my knee went through the first pane of the door. And I looked at my daughter, and her eyes are wide. And then I look back at the crack in the door, and I instantly felt convicted. And honestly, I felt ashamed. The outburst that just happened didn't need to happen. And I looked at Emma, and I said, I am so sorry. That was wrong of Daddy. Uh, this is why I need Jesus. Will you please forgive me? That was sin. And that just hung over me all day. And my wife came home and I confessed to her and I asked for her forgiveness. And we have been learning about the gospel and how it applies to our daily lives. And so she kind of led me through some questions that were so helpful. She said, why were you so upset in that moment? And I said, well, 
When they slammed the doors in my face, I felt disrespected. Like, here I am on my knees trying to love the girls in the midst of their sin, and, and they just totally rejected me. And she said, yeah, I understand. I understand why that would make you feel that way. So why did it hurt? Why did you feel so angry when they disrespected you? Well, because I was trying to love them and they rejected my love. I felt like they rejected me. I felt like they didn't love me back. She said, I understand. That's hurtful. So why did that upset you? And I was tired of her questions, to be honest. Like, that's it. It's the girl's fault. And I thought some more and I realized I believed that if a broken, sinful little girl like my daughter can't love me well, how could a holy, righteous God who knows everything I've done, how could he love me? Now, in the moment when I had that anger outburst, I wasn't thinking God doesn't love me, so I'm going to smash this door. But there was a root of unbelief in my life. And because I didn't believe the gospel, it played out in my relationships. And I was trying to behavior modify. As I sat there on the ground with this emotional whirlwind in my chest, so frustrated with my daughters, I was trying to keep it cool in my own strength. You know what I was really trying to do? I was trying to behavior modify so I could earn the love of God. And behavior modification is a way no one can bear up under because it does not deal with the real problem, the heart. Only the gospel can transform the heart. And as if I really understood in that moment the love of God for me, despite my sin, despite my past, whatever, no matter what situation I may be in, if I understood the love of God in that moment, other people's rejection of me wouldn't hit so deep. It would still hurt, but it wouldn't hit so deep and attack my identity as it did that day. I needed the gospel to change me because I couldn't change myself. And Paul goes on. He says, you learned it, it being the gospel, from Epaphras. Epaphras was a guy that, that was acquainted with Paul. And he says, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the spirit. Here's what I want you to hear from this portion. You may miss this. Disciples reproduce. Disciples reproduce. Let's look at it again. It says, you learned it from Epaphras. Paul was in a Roman prison, but he had been pouring into others. Timothy was one of them. Epaphras was another. And as he shared the gospel, at some point, Epaphras comes to faith and he begins growing in the faith. And Paul helps him become a, a, a mature disciple and a follower of Jesus and a great leader. And then he sends him out. And Epaphras goes to most likely his hometown of Colossae. And he begins impacting his sphere of influence with the gospel that's changed him. And a church sprouts up because of it. Disciples reproduce. God, uh, Paul understood the gospel does not end with him. And he poured that into Epaphras who understood the gospel does not end with him. And he goes and he pours into the people in his sphere of influence and the gospel takes root and a church is built. Let me say it this way. If the gospel you believe in ends with you, it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. If the mission you're on ends with you, it is not the mission of God. Because Jesus' vision is that the gospel would go to the ends of the earth. He says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I've taught you. That's the mission of God. If it ends with us, it is not God's mission. And so Paul poured into Epaphras who poured into his people. And you know, when I first heard about discipleship, I thought discipleship, honestly, I thought it was um, having awkward conversations with people you really don't want to talk to in a coffee shop about Jesus. Like that's really what I thought discipleship was. I thought it was evangelistic cold calls, like having awkward conversations about Jesus. Discipleship requires relationship. Look at the discipleship requires relationship. Let's look at the language that Paul uses about Epaphras. He calls him a dear fellow servant. He says he's a faithful minister of Christ. How does he know that? 
He's seen Epaphras pour out his life. He's seen the gospel played out in Epaphras' life. And discipleship requires relationship. This is relational language. I'm afraid far too often it is easy to have very surface level relationships. It is easy to talk about the weather and sports, maybe even read a good Christian book or discuss theology. All the while, behind all of those things is hidden the brokenness that's locked up in our hearts that we don't want anybody to know about. So discipleship requires relationship, but it also requires transparency. And this is tough. This is hard for everybody. I grew up believing I needed to always look right, act right, and speak well. I didn't want anybody to know that there was something broken or wrong with me, and that was a weight I could not bear up under. Over the the last several years, I've been extremely challenged to to walk in more transparency, and there's been a guy who's been instrumental in helping me do this. Uh, He's my good friend, Zach Newman. Over the past two years, I've I've had some medical issues. Um, I Honest, we don't know what's going on. I've had kidney problems. I've had major dehydration issues. I've had lightheadedness. Um, the doctors don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. And all my armchair physicians in life group and house church have no idea what's going on either. I love you guys. Um, but it, I, I would be lying to you if I, if I said I, I met this difficulty with great, with great faith. It's not true. There's been moments of despair Moments of immense discouragement. And a couple months back, um, I was having some really difficult episodes where I was, I was getting really lightheaded. And I, I messaged my good friend, Zach, and uh, I just told him, hey, man, I, I need your prayer. I need you to pray for me. Uh, I'm believing God hates me. Um, I'm believing that he is punishing me for, because of my past sins and my addiction with this physical problem. I said, I've been repenting. I've been searching my heart. I don't know if there's anything else. Uh, God hasn't revealed it to me, but this physical problem, I'm, I, I realize at the base belief, I really believe that God is doing this because he's mad at me. And Zach graciously responded. He said, I'll be praying for you. And I understand why you feel the way you do. But I also am gonna share the truth with you. God doesn't hate you. He loves you. While you were his enemy, Christ died for you. That's love. And then he said, and he's not punishing you either. Now, when he said that, I said, I thought, I know there's verses that talk about God loving me, so I get the connection there. But how do you know God's not punishing me right now? And he said, I know God's not punishing you for your past because Jesus took the penalty on the cross. Now, these two truths were something I I had heard and I had learned. I went to Bible school. They talked about it all the time, but they had not penetrated my heart in that moment. And in that moment, I could not believe them. I needed somebody outside of me to share the truth with me. I needed a safe, transparent discipleship relationship where I could bring my real brokenness to the surface so I could be restored. You know, it would have been really easy to just say, hey, Zach, I'm struggling. Pray for me. Or, or, hey, hey man, uh, I have a doctor's appointment. Will you pray for me? But Zach had created a safe place for me to be real. For me to, to say, hey, yeah, this medical stuff is scary, but here's what I really believe about God behind all of this, behind the fear. And he was a safe person for me to bring my brokenness to the surface. If we ever want to affect deep change in our lives or the lives of others, We must have deep gospel-centered relationships because the transformation we long for lies on the other side of transparency. The transformation we long for lies on the other side of transparency. But it's a difficult walk because we naturally want to hide our brokenness. The gospel says if we bring it to the surface, In gospel-centered relationships, it is the beginning of our restoration. Paul goes on in this passage. He says, For this reason, since the day we've heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding the Spirit gives. This verse is so convicting to me. 
Paul says, he's never met the Colossians, but he says, since we've heard about your faith, we've not stopped praying for you. If I'm honest with you, my prayer life is often very selfish. It's about me, my family, and the people that are very close to me. And here Paul says, I care for you. I pray for you since I've heard about your faith. And here's what he prays. He prays that they may live a life worthy of the Lord. And then he kind of explains what that looks like bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have a great life. That's not what it says. He goes through this litany of awesome things. Why? For endurance and patience. They're going to endure hardship and they're going to need to be patient. And he goes on, he says, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You know what I think he's trying to say here? If we ever want to live that life worthy of God, if we ever want to live that life worthy of God, it's going to take two things. It's going to take endurance and it's going to take patience. Why? Because growth takes time. Growth takes time. Growth is a difficult journey in the same direction over time. Let's look at it here in the passage again. He says, the two things they need are endurance and patience. I remember when I first really came to an understanding of how long it actually takes to grow. Um, I, was, I was meeting with somebody who uh, actually drew Ketchum, the family pastor, and myself. We were both meeting with this person just kind of discipling them. And I came back from uh, a meeting with this person and I was talking with Drew. I, just, I was so discouraged because it seemed like there was just this repeated struggle in the same area over and over and over and they weren't finding freedom. And I told Drew, I want them to experience the freedom of Christ. I want them to know their identity. I want them to, to be Christ-centered. And Drew asked me a question. He said, where do you think they are on the spiritual pathway? Do you think you're maybe expecting too much of them for where they're at? And I said, be quiet. <laughs> I didn't want to hear that question. I'm not expecting too much. Jesus wants them to mature. And he said, no. Where are they on the spiritual pathway? And I, I love the spiritual pathway at Family Church because it's so helpful. It gives, it gives um, handlebars to discipleship. It helps us understand where people are at and how to move them to become more like Christ. It begins with a seeker. A seeker is somebody who is spiritually dead. They are far from God. They have no relationship. They do not trust Jesus. And at some point, they have this moment of repentance and faith. Repentance and faith, where we would now call them a student. A student is a baby Christian. A baby Christian who needs lots of structure. They need help reading their Bible. They need help learning how to pray. They need to help learning how to follow Jesus in the real stuff of life and experiencing God in life. And then as they grow an understanding of their identity, at some point they transition to what we would call a servant. And a servant is somebody who's like an adolescent in their Christian faith. They're no longer a baby. They're no longer just focused on me. They, they realize the gospel means other people as well. And so they, they begin focusing outward instead of just simply inward. What can I get? What can I have? They begin focusing on others. And through time, usually God brings them through some difficult circumstances that kind of shake the foundation. And as they see the generosity of God and the love of God in the midst of suffering, usually that will transition to what we would call a steward. Somebody who's no longer self-centered or others-centered, but Christ-centered. And, and Drew asked that pivotal question. He said, where is this person on the spiritual pathway? And I said, uh, I think they're a follower. They, they're probably a student. He said, okay. He said, and what you want for them, where is that on the spiritual pathway? I said, I want them to be a steward. I want them to be Christ-centered. I want them to experience identity. I want them to live it out and, and experience life with Christ. And he said, and that is a great desire. That is a huge jump for somebody who's a student. I think you're expecting too much. I wanted discipleship to happen like that. And it can't. There are no microwave disciples. 
Because growth takes time. Because this is not a journey of activity. This is not a journey of activity. I learn stuff and then I start serving and then I start discipling somebody. This is not a journey of activity. This is a journey of the heart. And only God can change the heart in deep gospel-centered relationships. Growth takes time. It is a difficult journey in the same direction over time. I, I know I've shotgunned a lot of stuff at, at, at you and I don't want this to just simply be a, a message we hear and then we move on. I, I really want us to be a church that experiences gospel transformation. I really want us to be a church that understands the mission of God goes beyond me. And I really want us to experience that endurance and patience that Paul said so we can help others as well. So we're gonna release to the campuses and, and I want you to take the challenges that the campus pastors give you seriously. I want you to really evaluate them and I want you to, to step out and walk in them this week. I love you guys. Have a great week.